Good evening all and welcome to Big Tent Live Events, part of the Humanities Cultural Programme, itself one of the founding stones of the new Stephen A. Schwartzman Centre for the Humanities here in Oxford. I'm Wes Williams, I'm Professor of French Literature and I'm also the Director of Torch. And it's my enormous pleasure to say that we're coming to you live from the Ultimate Picture Palace, the excellent independent cinema on the Cowley Road here in Oxford. I'm also delighted to welcome the Chair or the first member of the discussion for tonight's discussion, Elika Burma. Elika is a writer, historian and a critic. She's Professor of World Literature at the University of Oxford, a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and a Fellow of the Royal Historical Society. And she was also a former member, sorry, a former director of Torch. Her most recent books are Postcolonial Poetics, 2008, and just last year, To the Volcano. She's currently on a British Academy Senior Research Fellowship, working on a project entitled Southern Imagining. We're here to discuss the themes, the questions, the issues arising from the book Afropean, with the author himself, Johnny Pitt, and in conversation, both Elika and Simakai Chigudu, Associate Professor of African Politics here at the University. I'll hand over to Elika now and uh, let her introduce the other speakers in the conversation. Over to you, Elika. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Wes. Uh, and thank you to everyone at home uh, or at work or wherever you are for joining us. We're all social distancing while safely live streaming this event at the UPP and we hope that you are all safe and well and surviving wherever you are in the world. Tonight is a really exciting opportunity to be with both uh, Johnny and Simakai and to discuss Johnny's amazing and award-winning book, Afropean Notes from Black Europe. As you heard, I'm Elika Burma, I'm your chair, and I'm also the investigator on the Writers Make Worlds website project, which is bringing you this event along with Torch. And the recording will hereafter be available through Torch and through the Writers Make Worlds website. In a moment, I'm going to introduce my fellow panelists, but before I do so, I want to just give a very quick tour through the next hour so that you all know what to expect. After these introductions, Johnny will, and we're very happy that he agreed to this, it's great, he will read an excerpt from the book to give a flavor of its narrative, of its rhythms. And this reading will be accompanied by photographs from the text. The book is illustrated throughout with Johnny's own photographs, and we wanted to give everyone a sense of the images and the text working together. We're really grateful to Johnny for having prepared this slideshow for us. After that, we'll turn to the conversation with Simakai and I, and then uh, after about 25 minutes of conversation, more or less, we will open for questions from you, the audience out there. So do send your questions in um, as, as, as they come up, as they bubble up. So it's now my pleasure to um, introduce uh, first uh, Johnny Pitts. Um, Johnny is a writer, photographer, and broadcast journalist and the author of Afropean. It's a beautifully written debut work which explores African European identity. It's received numerous awards, including the Decibel Penguin Prize, the Jalak Prize, and also the 2000, 2020 Bread and Roses Award for Radical Publishing. There is actually an exhibition of some of the photographs um, in Afropean, which is currently in Amsterdam, one of the cities that features in the book. And Afropean is also being translated into a range of major European languages, including French and Spanish. Johnny presents on BBC Radio 4's Open Book Programme, and he also contributes words and images to outlets like The Guardian and The New Statesman. Turning now to my colleague, uh, Simukai Chigudu. Um, as you heard, he's an Associate Professor of African Politics and a Fellow of St. Anthony's College. Simukai is interested in the social politics of inequality in Africa, and his first book, The Political Life of an Epidemic, came out this year, 2020. And as you can tell from the word epidemic, it was a timely publication in this strange year that we've spent. 
prior to joining the academy, Simukai was a medical doctor in the UK's National Health Service, the NHS. And his new projects are about Africa's place in the global politics of outbreak response and a book about nation exile and belonging. So, Johnny Simukai, thank you so much for joining us this evening and, and, and for this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. But first of all, as a kind of warm up, um, I'd like to invite Johnny, please, to read from Afropean along with the images. Thanks, thank Johnny. You. Thank you. It's, it's a great pleasure and honour to be here. <clears throat> Initially, I saw Afropean as something of a utopian alternative to the doom and gloom that surrounded the black image in Europe in recent years, and an optimistic route forward. I wanted to work on a project that connected and presented Afro-Europeans as lead actors in our own story, and with all this glorious Afropean imagery in mind, I imagine this would result in some kind of coffee table photo book with snippets of feel-good text to accompany a series of trendy photographic portraits. There would be images of the success stories of black Europe, young men and women whose street style effortlessly and elegantly articulated an empowered black European mood. <clears throat> It was a visit to the jungle in Calais in 2016 that encouraged me to reconsider this approach. Over some fragrant, milky Arabic tea, Hisham, a young man from Sudan who ran one of many small, remarkably organised cafes and had been living in the jungle for 10 months, told me how he'd lost everything, had no surviving family members, had painful memories of the past and tremulous visions of the future, and was stuck in this limbo land between Africa and Europe, home, a little of which he'd miraculously fashioned in his cushion-covered cafe and an anonymity. As I left his creaking plywood premises, he suggested that I write about his story and about life in the jungle, a request I was nervous about. This man was intelligent, articulate and literate. Wouldn't it be better that he write about the jungle himself? Maybe I could help attract attention to his writing or publish his story on the website that I run. But what did I personally know about seeing friends massacred? fleeing war, hiding from a life in shipping containers or on ill-equipped boats in order to arrive penniless at a bunch of cold, windswept shacks in the hinterlands of northern France, apart from what he was telling me. After exchanging contact details, I left the jungle on my bicycle and slowly realised that I was being watched and followed through the blustery streets of Calais by the French military police, the Gendarmerie. Attempting to enter the white gates of the port to catch my ferry back to the UK, I was stopped before I could even get to passport control. Searched, asked for my ID, where I was going, where I'd come from, how long I'd been away and why. Finally, after more questioning and looks of suspicion, I was allowed to enter an official compound I'd seen other brown-skinned men of my age look longingly at from a distance. I was in, they were out. Unlike the people I met in the jungle, I wasn't so much living in limbo as living with liminality. I was in because I had ID. I had ID because I was born and raised in England, had a history connected to Europe, knew how things ran. And yet within this piece of geography, this idea of Europe, I was frequently reminded that I wasn't all the way in. One Remembrance Day, a day I've come to dread for the way it spikes an ugly nationalism, which I sometimes find myself on the receiving end of, I was hit with that old chestnut and told, go back to where you came from by a middle-aged man, red-faced with rage and racism. My skin colour had disguised various facts, such as my grandfather having fought for Britain behind enemy lines in the Second World War and winning a medal for doing so. My skin had disguised my Europeanness. European was still being used as a synonym for white. If Afropean was something that could attempt to address this issue, I needed to find what lay behind or beyond its brand. Thanks so much, Johnny. And that does really give us a lovely flavour, I think, of, of, of the book and that kind of teetering between limbo and liminality that you trace. And it actually leads rather effectively into, into the, my kind of icebreaker question, my, my opener question. Um, as we've been hearing, uh, Afropean traces your journeys through some of the major cities of Europe and your encounter with black communities and their histories in those cities, often buried histories, invisible histories, obscure histories. 
It's a deeply personal journey, but it also deeply mines collective black history and then draws those threads of personal and political together. Could you just tell us a bit about your own journey in writing the book? I mean, you, you talk about that in the book. You know, you, you take your URL pass and you, you go to these different cities and you stay in hostels. But maybe can you just give us a, a, a sense of how that narrative came together and how you then saw that that story related to this much bigger story about African Europe? Well, this journey um, happened, you know, mostly in 2011, you know, uh, so it's quite a while ago that I took the journey. Uh, and um, before, you know, Brexit was on the table, but I started to notice uh, this juncture uh, between everything that I felt held me together. Um, as it was especially pronounced after the 2008 financial crisis. I think whenever there are economic problems, you start to notice a rise in racism. People are looking for scapegoats. Um, you know, anywhere but the financial institutions. <laughs> um, but even before that, um, I, I think really this book emerges out of the rubble of new labour. Um, and, and I think that there was certain, there was a kind of veneer of inclusion uh, under Tony Blair's reign that I think I, I bought into, uh, in the early days at least, certainly, you know, before the Iraq war. And, um, and, and I think we all, were quite optimistic as young people, sort of entering the world, leaving school in, and entering into Tony Blair's Britain. You had that cool Britannia moment. Uh, Britain felt forward-looking and multicultural. And I s gradually saw that dissolve under Tony Blair's leadership, actually. Um, uh, and uh, and as, as this country started creaking, um, I started to notice uh, language being used by people I would have once called friends, uh, especially my, my white working class friends that I grew up with. And, and just in general, I started to know goodwill, I started to notice goodwill crumbling a little bit. So in some ways, maybe this is a dramatic way to say it, but I think this journey was a journey of, of, of survival. It was um, feeling like this island that I'm living on no longer re quite resembled home anymore. Um, and, and how could I piece the jigsaw of identity together in a way that it would not just make sense for me, but make sense for, for other black Europeans. And then also in a, in a certain way, it makes sense to, to, to some of my white friends as well. This, this book is about trying to build bridges and trying to tell stories. In, in a nuanced way that will hopefully, um, after people have read it, um, change their opinions. Mm. Um, so, so I think, yeah, there, there are a bunch of things that, that really uh, contributed to me feeling like I had to just leave this country. Uh, and I wanted to go towards Europe because I found, you know, working as, as a music journalist, I was astonished um, by the obsession, this sort of anglophone obsession with America and the States and everybody looking to the States for answers. Whereas I felt that there were other countries um, dealing with the legacy of colonialism that might teach um, black people in Britain uh, um, how, how, to, how to deal with this rise in nationalism and also, you know, try and create some kind of narrative of solidarity amongst black communities living in Europe. On that note of kind of sewing together and music, I'm looking at you, Sir Mackay, because mm. I know that you, you came to ask some questions on, in that regard. Absolutely. Um, but I just wanted to begin firstly by congratulating you, Johnny, on what really is a wonderful book and a book that made for um, an elegant and poignant companion uh, during lockdown to be able to um, have the imaginative horizons of going on a, on a travel, on a journey with you uh, while stuck in my living room. Um, you begin the book by um, talking about Afropean as a compelling uh, and powerful word, one that might allow you to feel whole and unhyphenated. And you know, just a moment ago, you were describing this sense uh, and this tension between limbo and liminality, both terms connoting a sense of not quite being there yet, not quite arriving, not yet being whole. And as I started to read your book with this point of departure, 
you know, early on in your journey, as you talk about arriving in Paris, you confront, as you describe it, a kind of disquieting expanse of loneliness and uncertainty. And this phrase, you know, hit me in the chest um, as I felt it mirrored my own sense of arriving in Europe as um, a black teenager coming from Africa. And as you go on your journey, uh, encountering different iterations of what it means to be black in Europe, you start to fill this empty expanse with the vastness of this category of Afropean, which is at once very enriching, but really invites me to ask you, um, where do you land at the end of it? How do you wrestle with your own sense of what it means to be a black man in Europe today? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Uh, thank you, Simukai. Um, I think Christopher Hitchens, of all people, <laughs> uh, once said that the end of every book is a departure. And, and so for me, I'd, I'd, I'm not sure I really landed anywhere. And in the end, I realized that Afropean um, was, was less a destination and more of a departure point. It was, it was not a place that um, I kind of almost began this journey feeling overconfident about what it meant to be black, what Europe was, and, and what Afropean could be. Mm -hmm. um, and that very quickly began to fall apart. I've got to stop saying this because it's not a very good selling point for my book, but I often describe my book as a happy failure. <laughs> um, and, and, and what I mean by that, I suppose, is that, um, you know, the, the destination wasn't Afropea or Afropean. Mm. It was more that Afropean was a kind of portal into, into a, a different way of experiencing Europe, yeah. one that contradicted the kind of um, homogenised travel narratives that you might read from people like... Um, uh, you know, Paul Theroux or Bill Bryson or, or, or Jan Morris. Mm -hmm. um, Jan Morris for me is actually quite interesting because uh, she wrote a, a trilogy called uh, Pax Britannica, um, which is all about the British Empire. And as I was reading it, it's such an apologist account of, yeah. uh, of empire. But as I was reading it, um, the one thing I couldn't deny was that it was compelling. It was an astonishing way to, to, to think about or, or to experience empire. Mm. Uh, and I thought, well, if this is an apologist account, one that, that, that sort of depicts the empire as maybe a little bit problematic, but really just a jaunty old uncle trying to do its best. Um, I thought maybe I could write the shadow side of that, mm. uh, that narrative, but in uh, equally as compelling a way, you know, try, try to really enjoy the beauty of language and the beauty of narrative and try to pull people along with me where even if they didn't agree with what I was saying or, 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 or completely dis, yeah, hated the idea of Afropean, couldn't not keep turning over and, 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 and joining, you know, and want to join in with this journey. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Afropean less as a place of arrival and more as um, a, a, a place of departure. Yeah, I mean, so that comes across very um, convincingly in the book. And um, something that struck me, you know, I I've often thought, or at least I thought for many years uh, after arriving in the UK, that Europe or the UK would always be a point of transit before returning to Africa. It wasn't somewhere that I could ever belong and legitimately claim a black identity. Uh, and I've been revisiting and reworking that idea in the last few years as I begin to build my home here. And reading your foray into black Europe I expands this multiplicity around the meanings of blackness and blackness in Europe in a way that I found both recognizable, but also that you know, pulled way beyond my own experience of black identity in Europe. And that was really enriching and encouraging. Um, no, that's, that's, that's really great to hear because I think one thing that um, I wanted the book to achieve mm -hmm. was um, for four um, members of the black community living in Europe who may be alone to just offer a kind of sense of foundation, yeah. you know, to say that there are others yeah. <laughs> and, and this is what they're dealing with. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I keep thinking about our, our relationship to blackness. And we're from very different parts of the world, mm -hmm. um, but we're held together by this, this sort of notion of, of, of blackness. And so I wanted to try and be imaginative and create a word that, you know, is, is fluid. It's not monolithic. It's not, you know, it's, it's for 
if it resonates with, with you, then I'm happy. It, it won't resonate with anybody. I think there are people in this country, maybe especially with, with uh, let's say, Jamaican heritage, mm -hmm. who might, you know, their, their sense of identity isn't such a conundrum. They might feel very attached to the notion of what it means to be from Jamaica. For me, I wanted to create a, a space that, that took in uh, sort of slightly wider narratives. Yeah. And um, the other thing we share in common is our mutual love of hip hop. Uh, which I greatly appreciated the uh, references scattered throughout the book. Uh, I mean, you know, very early on, I think it's just in the, on page six, you quote the mighty Mo Steff, um, who, and it was a really apt quotation because it ties into what you're just talking about now about how um, in the US, as Mo Steff is commenting, uh, blackness is often treated in these high and low superlatives. You know, we are kings or we are paupers. Uh, yeah. We are queens or we are something quite derogatory. Um, and as I was thinking about hip hop and the role that hip hop has played uh, in my life, it's been this tremendous source of communing with black thinkers, black storytelling and black modes of self-expression, especially when I'm in white spaces. And now, you know, uh, teaching in Oxford, for all that there is to commend this institution, it's not a place in which hip-hop culture particularly thrives. <laughs> um, and so it made me think a bit about the kind of intellectual journey that you've been on, how you weave together um, popular culture, but you also weave together literature and aspects of social theory uh, neatly tucked away behind the narrative. Uh, and so maybe you could tell us a bit more about how you came to have such an expansive um, intellectual repertoire for being able to write a book like this. I mean, there's an awful lot of learning that's gone into writing mm -hmm. this and just how did you do it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, oh, um, I guess I began... Um, I didn't really begin here, but, but let's start here. Um, I, keep, I kept thinking of some of the Harlem Renaissance writers, and mm. what was beautiful about the Harlem Renaissance was how it was a, a, a complete scene that was scored. There was a music, there was a polit political backbone, there was, um, there was uh, art, there was dance, you know. Uh, so it's a complete movement. And, and, um, and, and I think of writers like Langston Hughes, you know, embedded in their words, in their poetry, is the sense of jazz. Mm. Uh, for me, I'm very much a part of the hip-hop generation. Yeah. And so it just seemed very obvious to me that, that my work should... I, I don't know how much it actually comes across, but even, um, even in the sentence structure, the way I... I mean, I sometimes use uh, alliterate a little bit too much. <laughs> in my, in my, but but the, the, the sense of, uh, of, of musicality in my writing, I hope... Uh, well, it really does come from the, the, the sense of uh, from what the hip hop artists were doing, mm -hmm. um, but even but before that, I think one one line uh, that made me want to be a writer. I mean, one album really it was it was an album by Black Star, oh, yeah. Mos Def and Talib Kweli, which I quote from in the book, which is just uh, an astonishing. I mean, it's quite interesting. I think that um, Talib Kweli's brother teaches law or is a graduate of law at Stanford. And I think in Talib Kweli, we have like a, a street lawyer. He's, he yes. dissect, he's got that kind of attention to detail that perhaps his brother took in a different direction. Mm -hmm. um, and then and you have Mo's death. And in that album, you know, um, you have a, a song like Thieves in the Night, mm -hmm. which um, is about Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. Mm -hmm. What an amazing way to introduce oh, young. Wow. Uh, uh, the, Talib Kweli has this quote where he says, uh, I speak at schools a lot because they say I'm intelligent. No, it's because I'm dope. If I was whack, I'd be irrelevant. <laughs> 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 I, I, and I just think that's what hip hop yeah. did at its best because it can also go the other way too. Yes. It can encourage a kind of ignorance. But at its best, hip hop can open up the world of literature. It can open up the world of politics to people who might not otherwise be engaged in the same way that the Black Panthers tried to do that uh, with, uh, with somebody like Emery Douglas mm. who would uh, depict... Uh, 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 in visual forms, um, third world, world politics to people who might not otherwise engage with it. Um, but yeah, there was one line, again, to go back to Talib Kweli that he says on the album, which is, look in the skies for God, what you see besides the smog, a broken dreams flying away on the wings of the obscene. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Oh, it's <laughs> yeah. And I think this, <laughs> this book is just me trying to do that over and over. That one yeah. line yeah. Is, is trying to in, in, invoke that in my sentences. So it's absolute hip hop.
was crucial to my life growing up when school was failing me. Um, um, hip hop was there taking me by the hand saying, mm. uh, saying you could be a man of letters in, in a way that, um, that, that, that my teachers um, you know, never did. I remember in, to go on a little bit, but I remember mm. like being obsessed, I've always been obsessed with words from a young age. But I just remember how um, at my primary school I was put into the lowest set, even though like I'm, I'm a, my white friend was put into the highest set. And we both knew that I was the, the writer, you know, yeah. or, or the one that was, and the reader, the, in, the one that is interested in, in words. Um, and I remember getting told off I once, I remember the teacher, she was talking about oxygen or something, or air. No, she was talking about air. I remember saying, oh, miss, is, is air ubiquitous? I just learned about this word ubiquitous and I wanted to, to try it out. I was like seven or eight years old. And, uh, and she told me to stop showing off. Oh, wow. And there was that constant sort of sense of, um, of, uh, of, of, you know, don't get above your station. You know, James mm -hmm. Baldwin talks about this. Yeah. Uh, you know, he talks about how, you know, as soon as he was born, the world seemed to take one look at him and, and, and want to put a broomstick in his hand. And he had to say, uh, I know what you're seeing and I know what you're thinking, but I'm not that person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For me, hip hop was a place that said, you know, you're not that person. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Can I just come in there on mentioning one of my favorite writers, Toni Morrison, and what you've been saying about words and word craft, Johnny, and also just narrative and people joining you on your journey, readers joining you on your journey. It's something I often explore with students, this idea of narrative as a, or writing, writing story or writing narrative as a mode of self-understanding. And that thought came to me again and again in reading this book, because you know, your journey of, or your journey through Europe is also a journey of self-discovery. At first, in the kind of the first half, you are kind of wandering and seeking. And then the pace really accelerates as you discover Marseille, discover these rich black histories on the Mediterranean and in Lisbon. And it's really buzzy and music comes back in and the, and the, the words have this really musical feel to them. So could you just talk a little bit mm. about narrative and self-understanding and that process of of, of writing as, 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 uh, as, I mean, sorry to sound naff, but as, as kind of discovery, as self-discovery and discovery of your community and your context. Yeah, I think it was, um, I think it was Tony Morrison actually, who said, um, I stood at the periphery and claimed it as center. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the more I traveled on my journey, it was a very tentative uh, uh, start to the journey and, 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 and I wasn't sure about what I would find. Uh, so Mikhail, you mentioned you know, that, that, that disquieting expanse that lay before me. And, and, and though I mentioned before that Afropean wasn't really a place of arrival, I started to get more confident in my sense of, of, of where I could find blackness in Europe and, and that actually the periphery yeah, yeah, having confidence in claiming the periphery as centre, you know, and so by, by the end of the journey, um, I, I've gone through all these places. I begin somewhere like Clichy sur Bois, which does not feel at all like home, and I feel very much like a foreigner. Mm. Um, but by the end, um, I, I started to be able to piece together commonalities. And I think that's one of the virtues of, of writing a book, you know, th throughout. Um, Throughout my book, I found m many different uh, points of disjunction. You know, like I, though I met, uh, you know, Tunisians who had an issue with Somalians. I met Angolans who had a problem with Capividians, you know. But if these communities weren't necessarily always talking to each other in reality, through constructing this, this book, I could make them talk to each other through, through, this, through this journey um, and, and, and experience the, the commonalities. And so, um, yeah, I think that in terms of it being a journey of discovery, which it, you know, it, it really was, um, I think it was just empowering to, to come face to face with many areas across Europe that were just like the one that I grew up in, you know, and, that, and, and almost like, I got the sense of something translocal by the end of it. You know, I, I grew up in Firth Park, a multicultural area on the outskirts of Sheffield, with these sort of, you know, 
convenience stores that sold ingredients that could be put in, uh, you know, Ghanaian stews, uh, uh, you know, that the, the, the kind of geography um, of my area, I, I kind of found that all over Europe and that felt very empowering. Mm -hmm. So yeah. one of the encounters that you go into in quite a bit of detail that um, is written and conveyed with in a riveting manner, in part because of the urgency of the circumstances that unfolded, was your experience with uh, Antifa uh, in Germany and uh, mm. being engaged in protest and in um, thinking seriously about a kind of radical left-wing politics, but also trying to wrestle with the place of black identity um, on the left. Now, this is an especially charged political question um, that we find ourselves wrestling mm. with in 2020, mm. where to the extent that we take a lead, for instance, from the US, um, blackness has solidified in many ways as a political identity. Yet we find in Europe it's a little bit more disparate or dispersed. Um, we also find a beleaguered left in many parts of, um, in many parts of the Western world trying to accommodate um, its commitments to uh, old trade union movements and to the working class, while at the same time trying to honor um, the challenges posed in multicultural society and about identity. So I wonder just from your experience, you know, in travel and in writing, how you've thought about some of these issues and how you've thought about this, this politics, both of identity and of more traditional kind of left wing politics sort of unfolding uh, on the European continent. Yeah, that's a really good um, question. Um, there was a really great conversation between uh, Paul Gilroy and Gary Young, mm. um, where they were talking about um, political moments that they could anchor themselves to, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And, um, and for Paul Gilroy, it was the Cold War, and it was the threat of of um, nuclear destruction right. and he was and, and that that mobilized him you know he was scared about that and it politicized him and he wanted to try and work things out and and with Gary Young he was saying that it was more um, well uh, what was going on in South Africa in the 80s mm -hmm. uh, and then also uh, the miners strike you know right. by the time my generation comes around which we're kind of a similar mm -hmm. age as uh, Mackay um, I feel like the left had been swallowed up a little bit um, by by that sort of new, new labour, um, and uh, I remember to go back to Paul Gray. He writes uh, he wrote something that was really interesting. He was talking about how his old in sort of the mid nineties he left to go and teach in in, in the United States, mm. and when he returned, his old comrades on the left were now suddenly. Uh, management consultants, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I just think that that interesting idea of, of, of people on the left being management consultants, you know, um, and, and that's kind of what happened with New Labour. And I think my generation, I mean, I'm speaking specifically. I think you probably had a, a, a different experience uh, uh, being from Zimbabwe, but for my generation in Britain, I think we were kind of apolitical. You know, there was that notion that Francis Fukuyama uh, put to the world about mm. the end of history, uh, the fall of communism. Uh, no alternative vision for the future other than neoliberal capitalism, mm -hmm. you know. And so, um, I, in my, as, as I came of age, words like ghetto fabulous were being yeah. used. There was a popular place in London called Favela Chic. What an awful <laughs> name for a, for a, for a club. Um, and um, people were playing a, a, a at being left, you know, what did being left wing really mean? It, you know, maybe wearing a Che Guevara shirt, or yeah. you know, it got commodified, and there was really, there was really no way to be left wing. Um, and it's interesting for me now to sort of see some of the issues that have emerged um, during and after Brexit, the financial crisis, mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump, yeah. uh, George Floyd, um, Black Lives Matter. You know, um, there are things that young people can connect to, uh, it's very obvious that, um, that things aren't right. Mm -hmm. you, I don't know if you remember this, but in, during the sort of heyday of the noughties, to try and call somebody racist, 
people would just, I mean, there was that notion of always playing the race card. You couldn't call yeah. anybody racist for love nor money. They just weren't having it. And you were thought to be some kind of e extremist. Uh, now, I think as the system sort of has unfurled and revealed itself through, uh, through, through these really charged moments, uh, it no longer seems uh, an overreaction to say that there is a huge amount of systemic racism in this country. And so I'm, I'm, so I'm seeing young people um, politically engaged mm -hmm. in a way that, that my generation wasn't really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and yeah, I don't know if that really answers your question, but for me, it's quite an, it's quite an exciting time uh, that, that maybe is comparable with, with, with the 1980s, uh, where, where, where I'm seeing people organise around these, these specific moments in order to create some kind of, to, to think. I mean, you know, in America, you know, the, the word socialism is being used. I mean, yeah. that's, that's amazing. For all the things that are going wrong in the world, that, 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 that kind of socialism is kind of entering the mainstream is kind of incredible. That people even talking about it is incredible. So that gives me, um, you know, that gives a little bit of room for hope, I think. I think you're right. And I would say that one of the beautiful things you capture in your book is that in documenting the diversity of lives of uh, the Africans and other black people that you encounter on your journey, you know, the, when you situate that within a wider political frame, it becomes very clear that there are these powerful links between history and histories of imperialism, uh, between various forms of class-based and labor exploitation, and of course between racial identity. So I think that this serves, again, as a powerful feeder into a more engaged and progressive politics for a younger generation. Yeah, I mean, as well, it, it, for me, it was, it was, you know, I'm not a historian, but um, it was a really interesting way in for me to think about history because I was trying to provide a very contemporary portrait mm. of Europe and of blackness. And of course, I was being naive because to provide a contemporary portrait, you have to, you, you know, every individual story um, from the people that I met would you could place that in history. They, they, it didn't just emerge from nowhere. It came with the baggage of history. And so, uh, you know, the book really could have been initially maybe a third of the size. <laughs> and then suddenly each story, each individual, now everything that I was seeing on the ground, uh, I started to see the shadows and the energies behind it. Mm. And, and for me, it was a way to make history breathe. Um, I, I quote a scholar, Michelle Wright, mm. who says, you know, history is a... Uh, is not behind us, it's all around us in changed form, mm. uh, which I think is really interesting. It ties in with a lot of physicists uh, say when they talk, they talk about time as, as kind of, um, uh, people don't really actually know what time is, but how it's just different configurations of the same ingredients. And I think mm. that's a really interesting way to look at, uh, at history and, mm. and the history of blackness um, when trying to portray something that's contemporary. Yeah, absolutely. Trying to, draw out that emphasis on what is around us, the history that's around us. I'd also like to think about the audience all around us mm -hmm. um, listening and enjoying. And I've got a bunch of questions that are kind of, you know, coming through here um, on, on, on my phone. Um, so uh, is, it, is it okay, Johnny, so that we, we kind of open out to questions from, oh, yeah, from the absolutely. audience? Um, so, so there's one which is a kind of like a bridge question here that, that, that I've picked to, to, to start us off um, on this phase. Um, it's, it's from someone called Chris and, and uh, they say, um, the way you captured Marseille was one of the most striking and beautiful things I've read. No one has captured the city, the soul of the city better than that. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about what Marseille means to you? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm so glad somebody asked the question about Marseille. I get really romantic about Marseille and in the book. I probably allow myself to be a little bit too romantic about Marseille. It's a, it's a city with a lot of issues, a lot of corruption, human trafficking, drug trafficking, uh, a, a very um, a pronounced right-wing presence as well. Something that I found quite interesting though is that the, the local sort of uh, 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 spokesman for the National Front in Marseille, um, I don't know if it's still the same, but was it was a black guy. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> Which, um, um, and that, that's so Marseille, you know, it's, uh, yeah. um, um, I mentioned I'm from a place called Firth Park uh, in Sheffield, um, which is a very multicultural, a huge Yemeni community, 
big Jamaican community, Somali community, white working class community. When I visited Marseille, it struck me as, and I, and I jokingly refer to it as such sometimes, as Firth Park on the Sea. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a city where despite all the inequality that is there, it's a city where working class culture is lived uh, in the centre of the city. It's so much a part of the city's mythology. Um, in a way that you can't say for cities, uh, any other city in France, but really across Europe, there's nowhere like Marseille where you're confronted with, with multiculturalism and with um, working, working class multiculturalism. There's nowhere, I don't think, in, in Europe, maybe even including London, uh, where you can find uh, working class life lived in the centre of the city in such a way. So I felt immediately um, at home there. Um, it's the, really one of the, 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 it's kind of a birthplace of French hip hop, one of the biggest mm -hmm. French hip hop groups I am um, uh, are from Marseille and, um, and, and encoded in I am's music is uh, a lot of Egyptian mythology and initially when I hear their music, I, I heard their music before going to Marseille, I thought they were trying to do what the Wu-Tang cl uh, Clan did, which was kind of like uh, take a, a, a culture, like, like they, they use Chinese culture, and just claim it as their own as a way of escaping the, the reality in front of them. Uh, whereas in actually what I am were doing were, were honouring uh, the culture that was right on their doorstep, um, mm. which was uh, a Mediterranean culture, which was a North African culture. Um, uh, and Actually, I think of Paul Gilroy's concept of the Black Atlantic, um, mm. I, and I often say this, but um, if you were to take Paris and Cairo, um, you're never going to confuse those two cities with each other. You know? mm. You'll never say, oh, that looks like Paris when it's Cairo and vice versa. But if you take the cities from uh, France and Egypt that are on the Mediterranean coast from those two countries, right. Alexandria and Marseille, there's this shared culture. So it's a way of thinking about an identity that can be rooted in a place, but that can also be fluid and, and look beyond uh, nationalism. So that's what Marseille is for me. It's a black Atlantic city. It's a, it's a city that is, um, is connected to, to Africa. They say in, in Marseille that it turns its back on France to stare out lovingly uh, 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 you know, the Mediterranean and the Maghreb. <laughs> Um, on, on the nation, um, here's a, here's a um, perhaps more, more difficult question, um, um, challenging question uh, from Catherine. Um, your honesty about shifts in the idea of Afropean is really compelling. How do you feel about it now, looking back? Uh, and dare I say this word, the B word, has Brexit shifted your sense of the availability of Afropean identity to us at all, or not? It hasn't actually. If anything, it's made me want to double down on the notion of Afropean because as um, you know, these individual European countries kind of start to think in a more insular, nationalistic way, it, for me it's more important than ever that the black communities uh, that maybe feel marooned in each country um, build something larger than that, n that nation. Um, so for me, it's uh, as important as ever to think about, about, about Europe and about what it means mm. to be black and European and, and to try and build kind of networks of solidarity in the face of this rise of right-wing racism. Um, in terms of the word Afropean, um, again, it was something that I just, I just wanted to sort of move through, you know? Uh, and and it, like I say, I said before, it, it really wasn't, uh, a destination. I don't walk around saying, oh, I I'm Afropean, I'm an Afropean. It was more just like a, almost a heuristic, you know, a, a, way, a way of stepping into a world that could, uh, you know, um, ev evoke my, uh, my, experience, uh, my experience of sort of plurality, you know. Um, so, so for me, Afropean is just a useful term that, that, and also like a term that has built an online, I've built an online community around. Mm. I mean, mm. what's great, there are so many gaps. The, the worst thing anybody could do with Afropean is look at it as some definitive account of the history uh, of black Europe. It's not that, um, it's, it's, it's a personal account that hopefully mm. um, uh, arrives at something that is universal. But, um, 
Um, what's been amazing about it is that people have noticed gaps in the work. People said you didn't go to anywhere near enough, like sort of Eastern European countries. Um, uh, you know, there are huge um, countries uh, in the south of Europe. I mean, you know, the Spain, I, I, I just breeze through Spain, breeze through Italy, which are two places which are particularly interesting when you're looking at what's happening uh, with, uh, with, uh, with refugees trying to escape Lib Libya and Sudan and, and going to these countries. Mm. Uh, and what's been amazing is that like, this book emerges from this online community, which is afropean.com, and initially it was a Facebook page. Um, and, and people would guide me, uh, you know, from the community and say, oh, if you're going to Lisbon, you need to meet my friend here who will take you here. And, um, and, but then what I want the book to do now is to go back into that community. And, and so there are people who are now writing from the perspective, you know, we, we had somebody who was writing about growing up uh, black in Slovakia, you know. We had somebody who wrote about growing up uh, gay and mixed race in the Isle of Wight. Uh, we're starting to see people get in touch who are saying, you didn't write about this place, but, but I, I'm from here, can I contribute? And, and that's what Afropean should, should be. It should be, um, the book especially, mm -hmm. should be just a tool to encourage people to, to share their stories. There's a really positive charge in that. Um, this, I've, I've picked this question um, because it takes us back to the photographs with which we began. Mm -hmm. um, it comes from Phil. Um, how did you choose the photographs you've chosen to include in the book? Um, I'm really curious about this too. Presumably the ones that made it in are parts of a much broader project, much broader whole. Do you have any particular organizing principles or elements that you were looking for when you were choosing the photographs for the different pages? Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, I use the photographs uh, strategically throughout the book to give people a break, <laughs> you know, to, to, to like, um, I always appreciate it when authors sort of write shorter chapters or just uh, uh, give, you, give, give you the chance to sort of ponder something. And so for me, it's like, I always try to place the images throughout. So when, when it's kind of, when you've read something that might be heavy or, 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 or tricky or that even you disagree with, you can just take time out with a photograph and, and it kind of allows me to quietly try and dictate a kind of mood as well. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, much like I, I started out wanting to tell success stories uh, of Black Europe at the beginning of the book and then it became more complicated and hopefully more nuanced, um, that, that happened with the images as well. Initially, I was taking photographs with a very shallow depth of field, portraits, almost like there's a book called The Sartorialist, which is sort of these, these beautiful po uh, photographs of people with great street style, and, and they're sort of, they look amazing. And almost like, um, there's a strong tradition in African photography of, of people wearing their Sunday best, you know, of people mm. posing. Mm. So I started out in that tradition. Uh, as I was going along, um, uh, and, and I started to do this as I was traveling, but actually really after, after the travels were over and I had this collection of photographs that I was looking at and trying to edit, um, I started to want to reject that a little bit. And, and I was less interested in posturing, more interested in posterity. You know, I wanted to show what an everyday black life look like now you know and and what i found was that it was a lot of the time it was the mistakes uh, uh the, the 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 photographs that weren't decisive you know Henri cartier bresson talks about the decisive moment uh and and i was trying to capture the decisive moment uh, almost like a hunter and those images uh, i had to reject that kind of way of shooting because that emerges from colonialism he developed that idea of hunting wild game in in french africa <laughs> you know you know um he developed that whole idea um uh, when he, when he was out in the, in the ivory coast uh, i believe um so i started to reject that and and look at the images on the periphery of the collection of mistakes and images that i didn't i didn't get any sense that they were good photographs and suddenly because i spent a, you know years with this collection they started to have meaning for me and started to talk about an everydayness 
that was so important uh, for my book. And um, I, I should say that if anyone's in, in Amsterdam, um, they should go and try and see the, the show at Foam Gallery because it, it, is, it is a really great representation. We call it a bricolage of blackness. It's, instead of showing individual images, we put all the images sort of together in this kind of mosaic. And so you look at it from a distance and it's kind of this, this huge mosaic. But when you tune in, you see all these different fragments of blackness. You see, you see sometimes the success stories, you see in everydayness, you see sometimes people struggling. And that for me, to get that kind of brilliant broad um, notion of what it means to be black in, in the images was really important. So, so I'm really proud of, of that exhibition. I feel like it's a much truer actually representation of the photographs than, than you can even find in my book. It, it, the photographs add to that sense of mosaic that you, that you talk about in, in the book. You know, it's words and images that come together in a mosaic. Yeah, absolutely. A mosaic of Afropean. Um, I mean, thinking, you know, th th there's a question here that relates directly to that metaphor you just used about hunting and, yep. and you know, colonial hunting. Um, um, and it's, it's from uh, uh, Lucia. Um, and and um, uh, it is, this is the question. Um, you talk about museums in the book, uh, especially in Belgium, you know, the really bizarre uh, museum at Tefuren. Um, how could museums develop displays that are not about colonial triumphalism, that avoid that? How indeed can they better reflect Afro-European? Uh, that's not a question that I feel equipped to answer really. I, you know, the, the truth- It's very fraught at the moment. In, yeah, in, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know. Um, one thing I will say is that um, I remember seeing an artist, Sherry Samba, who's a, a uh, a, a Congolese artist was invited to create some art that critiqued the museum. And so for me, I think it's about inviting in, I don't know how I feel about Tufferden, you know, the, the, mm. the way they've changed it. Mm. Because it was a museum of a museum, you know, it was dark and there was no way that you could enter that museum and actually come out with a good idea or, or, or and come, out that, um, come out with the idea that uh, the Congo Free State was something that was uh, benevolent, you know. <laughs> There's no way, it's very dark, even though it's trying to show this, uh, this triumphant notion that, and that, they, that, 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 that King Leopold and the Belgians were in the Congo to try and uh, civilise the savages. You know, when you go there, it's written all over, all over that museum that it was, a, it, it, was a, it was a dark venture. And what I think sometimes should happen is that artists, um, curators who are, uh, who are representative of the, of the people who were subjugated uh, by such places. I think they should be invited in to reimagine and reinterpret uh, mm. these spaces rather than just glossing over the spaces in general. But, but there, are, there, are, there are people who, uh, who are better positioned to answer that question than I am, you know, mm. because I've, the whole ethos of my book really is to look at black Europe from the street level and to, yeah. to not to not think of it in, in, in institutions but more look at it as a lived experience out on the streets. Mm. Yeah, yeah. There have been some very interesting, for example, Indigenous Australian artists who've engaged with the Pitt Rivers collection here here in Oxford, which is one example of what I you were touching say that on. If, if, if anybody's, uh, you know, to the person who asked that question, sorry, I forgot the name, but um, um, you should check out um, a, a movement that's uh, put on by somebody called Onyekachi Wambu, who, um, uh, and he's got a movement called Return of the Icons, which is all about returning um, objects mm, to, yeah. to, to, to Africa. Uh, and he's a brilliant person, actually. He, he, he created a, a series, um, if you can try and get it, that was produced by Pebble Mill in 1992 called Black on Europe, um, which mm. is an amazing six-part series uh, looking um, uh, at, at the black lives just as, um, you know, right around that moment of the EEC, you know. And so, um, yeah, look up on Yukachiwambu and Return of the Icons. You'll find some, some, some better answers there than I can give. We're moving close to the end now, sadly. Um, but I do have, um, maybe we have time for one, maybe, maybe two questions. Um, so here's a question from Christopher. Um, thank you so much for your time, your comments. Um, how has Afropean shaped your understanding of multiculturalism today? 
um, and during Blairism? So it's quite a complicated question. So mm -hmm. take it as you as you will. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. How 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 has Afropean shaped your understanding of multiculturalism today and Blairism? I think what happened with New Labour is that uh, a kind of corporate multiculturalism emerged, where you had. Um, I mean, politicians in general seem to stop talking about their big dreams for society and more about what was good for business. Mm. Uh, and so you start to see, um, uh, I've been thinking about this a lot, you know, you might have somebody uh, from Delhi um, with uh, meeting up with somebody from Lagos uh, in a business lounge in Narita Airport. And, and 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 think ah oh, multiculturalism you know but but it's it, there's a kind of elitism attached to that idea of multiculturalism where 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 it's all about the about global capital you know um and what happened with uh, something quite interesting with new labor is they they on the one hand seem to sort of promote a kind of notion of multicultural britain and on the other hand you know the mp for my local constituency where i grew up which was brightside um was david blunkett who famously went on record to say that britain was being swamped by asylum seekers you know so for me uh what i'm interested in is trying to put together a kind of multicultural culturalism in 2.0 which tries to attach it to working class culture again and 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 and, and tries to ask you know uh white working class people to broaden their sense of what it means to be working class for a start and to look at how some solidarities might be forged there that could battle it's amazing to me how so many working class people that i know from sheffield white working class people see boris johnson as an ally and it's the same in the states they, they, they see somebody like uh uh donald trump as an ally you know i bet he's fun on a night out kind of thing uh and and for me i think what i wanted to do i, I want to i want to insert multiculturalism back into that identity of the working class mm -hmm. that, that actually these people are the enemies of the working class rather than people who who are your friends they're not mm -hmm. your donald trump's not your friend if you're poor on class there is actually a question that relates to the previous one and i'm just going to 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 try to squeeze in before we close. Um, uh, Sarah asks um, that um, Af Afropean um, is, a, is a word to create a, a, a black European identity, but do you think that the word means the unification of very different classes of black people living in Europe? And you know, is it, is it a, a kind of like a, uh, 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 an umbrella term in a way, but bringing different class fractions, different classes together. I mean, I think she's, I'm, I, I'm, I'm interpreting here, but you know, she's worrying about those different classes coming together under that one heading. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope so. You know, this is not a term, I think there's, there's a place for various configurations of blackness you know and so i don't want to critique even something like uh, an, uh, afropolitanism you know but for me afropean can't be about sort of the success stories of, of, of people who uh, can afford to move to big cities and 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 work in uh, in, in in the media industry or you know um it, it has to involve working class people uh and so that's i think that was the beginning of my journey really is uh, you know, the word emerged from uh, when when David Byrne uh, signed Zap Mama, and together they coined this term Afropean, and it emerged from music. And but what I realised is that what was happening with Afropean within the realm of music is it always involved stylists and uh, and, and 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 fashion photographers. And for me, I mean, not only did that not include my own story, uh, that notion of this really successful Afropean identity, but it had, you know, it had to take into account uh, black men and women who work as cleaners, mm -hmm. as security guards, mm -hmm. as street sweepers, as you know, um, uh, as 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 mothers, as fathers. You know, it had to go, go beyond this sort of notion of this almost quite sort of capitalist notion of the success story. Um, so I hope that Afropean is something that um, that, that that working class people. Uh, uh, feel uh, you know resonates with their experience it was certainly built from those ingredients because um, of where I grew up thanks Johnny um, with regret it's been fantastic um, we're going to have to um, move to a close 
Um, I'm just going to say a few closing words and then, and then thank you very much. Um, this brings us to the end of another fantastic evening here at the UPP, the Ultimate Picture Palace, um, part of the Big Tent Live events. And thanks so much for hosting us. A huge thank you to Johnny Pitts and to Simakai Chigudu uh, for your inspiring conversation, thoughts, um, and for everything that you have told us about Afropean. Johnny, I mean, you took us on it, I think, across this past hour. You've taken us on a journey through the book and you've taken us as surrogates on your journey through, through Black Europe. And that's been a great privilege and, and a great pleasure. Um, I can really recommend this book to everyone who hasn't yet discovered it. Um, I'd like to thank everyone out there, to all the viewers at home for watching, for your amazing comments and questions. Really sorry that they were literally just kind of pouring into my phone a moment ago. So I'm really sorry if we didn't manage to get around to um, picking all the questions. Um, there were loads. Um, and then um, I'd just like to uh, invite everyone to join us for the next Big Tent live event on Thursday, the 5th of November. No, remember, remember, the 5th of November at 5 p.m. live from another Oxford venue, which will be the Hollywell Music Room, when we'll be hosting a live performance from opera soprano Nadine Benjamin and pianist Nicole Panitza. Um, and I also, for those of you who've perhaps uh, missed some of this or want to see it again, um, the recording will be up on Writers Make Worlds. Um, thanks so much, Johnny. Thanks, Simakai. And thank you, everyone, for joining us and hope to see you again soon. Bye.